the topic of discussion is basically whether the EU uh, should federate or not and how to involve the, uh, the public in these discussions. So what we'll do is um, introduce myself. I'm James Bailey. I'm the, one of the volunteers for the European Union uh, page here on Google+. Plus. Um, my involvement within the, with the EU has been for about four or five years. I used to be pretty active on YouTube um, and also in internal forums. Uh, just for the record, I'm not an, an EU employee. I'm purely a volunteer. So if we go around, introduce yourself guys, um, starting off with Alexander. Hello, uh, my name is Alexander Hedianis, uh, you can call me Alex D for short. I'm a consultant, project manager on uh, business and the environment, uh, founding partner of uh, one company, Simprex Steam, which is registered in Athens. Uh, the base for most of the projects I do is uh, actually Brussels. One of the projects we have is uh, buildup.eu, it's the European portal for energy efficiency in buildings. So expect uh, from my side, let's say, uh, not so much perhaps a, a Greek, uh, but uh, a more European perspective of things. It's a great honor to be here with you, by the way. Uh, Cedric? Okay, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Cedric Lombion. I'm from France. I study in Bordeaux, France, and I study communication, political and public communication, especially. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, the European Union issues, the, the global Europe uh, in general, and sustainable development. I'm as well a manager of the Europeans on G Plus page, and I'm glad to be here with you. Uh, Isaac? Hi, my name is Isaac Trumbo. Uh, I was born in Spain um, and grew up between Spain and the United States. Uh, studied Chinese and business. Uh, spent, you know, many years working around Europe and China, and now have been, you know, moved back to Barcelona. Um, as for my knowledge of EU politics, I'm just, you know. A beginner. I, I'm very interested in in everything that has to do with you know, the European Union, especially nowadays where it's becoming uh, more federalized uh, with the banking systems. So I'm hoping that I can contribute some something to this discussion. Max, hi. I, I lost you in the wind. I was searching for the window in which you were alive. Okay, hi. Um, well, my name is Max Huyke, um, which is unpronounceable with any language except for Dutch. Um, yeah, I can't help it. My, my parents never realized I would go abroad. Um, my interest in Europe is uh, uh, based on my study. Uh, I, I studied international, uh, international politics and wrote my thesis on the European market, but that has been, you can see, that, I, that has been a very, very long time ago. So, um, and afterwards I have been uh, an entrepreneur in Europe and encountered the European limitations in, in reality, you know, day-to-day -day operations. So, I'm still hugely interested and the third reason I'm interested is I emigrated to Spain six years ago from the Netherlands, um, and that makes you realize uh, how much more Europe is than you realized on paper, and on the other hand, what the limitations are. So uh, that's why I, uh, I'm uh, quite involved on G+, Plus, on the European scene. Uh, I've set up the page Eurotech, uh, which reports about European technology and science. Uh, from every day we have a new article with a whole team. Uh, I set up the page, Cedric does a great job managing it, but I came up with the idea, that's my only contribution, I think, uh, to set up the page Europeans on G+, Plus, and, and I have tried to unite Europeans in general to, you know, to become more of a, a, visible, uh, a visible body of people on G+, Plus in, in view of all the Americans. Okay. Uh, Robert. Yes, hello, my name is Robert Radel. <clears throat> I'm an IT consultant from Vienna, Austria, and my uh, interest in the European Union is uh, mainly on 
uh, the financial financial stuff, and that I see a little difference between big corporations for for big corporations and uh, people with lots of money, uh, a very small percentage. Everything is global and and free, and not many limitations. It's it's my feeling, and for small comp companies and individuals. There are many limitations and many different laws and many, still many borders within the European Union. <clears throat> and so I hope that this direct dialogue uh, and the newest technology using Hangouts for that, I'm really excited that this channel exists now. Not a problem. We're waiting on one more participant. Um, she's running a bit late, so she, uh, Dana will be joining us shortly. Um, okay, with the EU today, there are a number of issues um, that it confronts on an economic, social, and a political aspect. Do you guys believe that the EU's issues can be resolved through federating, or is it better to go backwards and go to a looser, maybe more economic type union? James, sorry, just just a brief uh, cut uh, break for uh, for information. Perhaps uh, should we say a couple of things to people watching us of how they can comment on what we are saying? Go for it. Smarty days. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody who wishes to post any comments or any questions, you can do so through the European Union uh, Google Plus page, or if you click on the. YouTube link, there's actually a comment section there where you can watch it live as well through YouTube. Okay, uh, who wants to go first regarding the European Union? Should it federate? Uh, well, that's if you ask sure. me, oh, okay. Who, go who got okay, I got the mic, okay. Um, uh, I, I find the question effectively a bit a bit strange as in there is no going back I know that there is a large populist movement in Europe I mean I think about every country has a populist, mov populist movement which which hammers on the idea of getting back to nationalism but the reality is that we are now more than 50 years into the European Union um, there is no going back uh, the there is most of most of the countries which are publicly uh, opposing it or have doubts about it um, are so it, it, their economies are completely intertwined already. I mean, I come from the Netherlands, but it will be the same for Robert, who comes from Austria. We we have large neighbors. We do business with them. We do business with the whole of Europe. I I don't believe there is a, a, a way back. There's only a way forward. Okay. So even even though organisations like UKIP, for example, um, from the UK, they put they're pushing for a looser, more economic type um, union for the EU. Do you not see that as an option? That is that is not the problem. Is define economic. I I I, I think I learned most. I was opposed to the European Union when I was a student. Um, I was. Uh, was member of a leftist leftist party. I didn't like big corporations. So I didn't like the, the scale you represented to me. So I, more or less, sentiment you see nowadays again. But I spoke about people who are. I have spoken with the commissioner for internal markets, for instance, and he he said, look, what is happening is that every economy tries to protect his own interests. So, uh, what is an economic? open zone without more control. If you have no control, for instance, about product quality, product requirements, warranty, whatever, there is no economic zone. Because if Germany can offer products without, or no, that's the wrong example, let's say that the Netherlands would offer a product without, with a warranty of only one year, uh, which doesn't satisfy any requirement in the European Union, which is made by, by slave labor, whatever, we could easily undermine the UK or the Germans, who are much more stringent. So to have a level playing field economically, you need to make sure that everybody gets, for instance, the products meet the same product requirements, but also if the minimum wage levels are very, very different in Europe, there is no free economic competition anymore. So if the UK wants to sort everything out itself, 
uh, a bit like the Germans who made a big row about that their beer should be protected. I mean, their beer has been it's a special quality beer, so uh, only Germans can make German beer. Uh, if you do that, you, you effectively uh, raise the borders again economically, because if you start to have all sorts of national requirements, national laws, national protection, national music industry, etc., there is no economic, uh, no, no real economic competition within the European Union. Robert, what's your thoughts on this? We'll go around, <coughs> go, go around the list. Yeah, for <clears throat> for me it is again uh, the question that the the big split uh, when you look at the the so-called Gini coefficient about how how unequal wealth is uh, uh, spread against uh, the population. So uh, Max is right, I believe, but I would say only maybe on on a big scale. For example, big corporations and big money needs. A, a bigger playground, but uh, isn't it true that um, a local business has not much of a chance to profit from a bigger union? And so we still have so many different uh, laws in in all the different countries. So I I have a hard time to to see the benefits of the European Union, especially if I compare the discussions at the beginning when everybody said, okay. Switzerland is not joining, you are in the middle of the European Union, isolated. Uh, <clears throat> these were all the predictions that we hear now when someone says, okay, why not uh, make things more locally again? And look at Switzerland today and, and the European Union. I, I only can uh, say it from a non-expert perspective, but uh, when you see, for example, those little details that the private debt that Spain has is bigger than all the other European countries that have, have lots of debt on the private side. And all, all those big shifts like the, the low interest rates that were made equal across the Union made, made an unhealthy flow of capital uh, to the, of, or let's say <coughs> virtual currency to the thousand countries and lots of games have been played and, and all those big players uh, we never see sanctions again against what they did, and and every uh, citizen has still to pay the taxes and stuff, and the <clears throat> the security umbrella that is now brought, and which may still be too small if also the private uh, bank debts are taken into account to save everything. Uh, okay. This this is for me has the feeling like like a, a tax that is forced on the on the citizens of the European Union without asking them if they are okay about yeah saving I don't know Luxembourg has one billion euros per inhabitant debt and, and stuff like that. So I do not know if <coughs> if we could be more um, efficient in in a still I understand a global economy but if we could work more uh, together when everybody is motivated to be part of a bigger system. And I really hope okay. that, that digital technology can help us to, to work better and faster together on all levels. Okay. Alex? Um, well, first, to, to take it from the point that, uh, that Max was saying um, about what is economy, I would say that at the moment, uh, what you say is not th that there is no turning back is true also to a large extent in the society. Uh, we have what we call the Erasmus generation. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not part of it. I'm just a little bit older. Uh, but we have the people who have grown up uh, and studied in various places around Europe and they have uh, a multicultural background on the one hand and they also have the opportunity uh, to contribute to a much greater uh, Europe than to a specific country. At the same time, uh, going to what Robert says uh, and looking at it from the perspective uh, of, of a small country, Greece, which is facing uh, real, really very big challenges at the moment uh, with uh, literally hundreds of thousands of small uh, and medium enterprises um, 
either being shut down or in a very precarious situation, I would say that the ones that have managed to uh, survive, and and I would I would add my own company in in these, uh, are the ones who uh, were out um, were outwards thinking, uh, who collaborated with other similar companies outside Greece. Uh, who manage to create products that are uh, exportable and that contribute to the greater European good. That's one, one important point. And we should not uh, forget, uh, <laughs> I should say last but not least, there is an important brain drain happening uh, in, in countries like that, Greece, uh, Spain, Italy, uh, when you have 25% unemployment or 50% of the young, uh, young people's uh, unemployment, you see that those people have to be, and they do have the, the potential, um, they have to be um, uh, employed somewhere else. So at the end of the day, we are seeing national issues we are seeing issues at the national level that cannot be resolved at the national level. They have to be, they have to be resolved at a large level. And these, and these issues, whether they are economic, whether they are uh, uh, environmental, or they are social, they transcend uh, the, the, um, the national level. And to what, uh, to what Max was saying, at the level of competition, we are competing uh, with a China who is uh, a few European Union sizes in itself. We are competing, competing with the United States. We are competing with entities that act as nations. And we need to compete at that in a similar level ourselves. It's but a good point, as in uh, you say act like a nation, but uh, the United States indeed is is, uh, considers itself a nation, more or less, but it is a federation as well. Uh, it's the United States of America. Uh, and I think that the example of the United States shows where Europe is heading, as in, um, I think most as Americans associate very strongly with their states. Uh, they, 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 lots of things are at state level, uh, decided on state level, they identify with their own states, but on the other hand, they travel throughout America and are proud of American, um, you know, the global efforts of the Americans. So it, it shows, you know, if you give it a bit of time, they took 200 years now, uh, people can work on, on both levels, the local level of the state, identifying with being uh, someone from Alabama uh, or from New York, which are very different people, uh, but on the other hand, being a member of the United States and a citizen of the United States. And I think that's the model where we are looking at. Cedric? What I find, what I find um, somewhat paradoxal is that um, the European Union has been uh, so far... Can you hear me? Yes. yes. The European Union has been so far um, an economic institution a legislative institution and much less a social or cultural institution. And, and it's funny to see that uh, the European Union is criticized on this basis because uh, everybody, uh, now people are saying, uh, yes, the European Union is there, but it hasn't helped my country to be better, etc. And at the same time, some people say that we should go back to um, to what the European Union mainly is right now. And I believe that um, going backwards to just uh, something like the European Free Trade Association it, um, won't change anything. Uh, okay. Actually, uh, the, the only way to go is forward, like Max said. And, and, and another point is that uh, what I was talking about, the European, the Europe of future, the, the social Europe, is are the issues that we need to work on because um, so far uh, it's been, like Robert said, uh, a Europe good for the big corporate corporation business, but not really for the citizens which we um, 
who are trying to 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 develop a, a local not really a local it won't be local anymore but a little business and work with Spain or with France or with uh, yeah. with other European countries um, and the the other point I want I wanted to uh, to talk about is that it's it's not it's not easy. Uh, we have to reckon that it's not easy to to say that uh, from now on citizens will shape the future of Europe because uh, in each country there is a different democratic culture. And uh, for example, in France, uh, there is a lot of debate about. Uh, people only going once or twice a year to vote and then uh, forgetting about um, the, the deputies for the war mandate. Um, and on the other side, there are um, um, what I mean is there are national debates which clashes with the intents of the European Union. In France, again, um, there is a strong debate about how uh, 1973 law um, uh, stripped the, the state of its power to regulate its money. So it's, it, this, this kind of uh, national views uh, clashes uh, with uh, the, the global view that European Union tries to push uh, towards citizens. So it's not easy to um, to um, ask citizens to see it, uh, to see the global view, to see the bigger picture. But we have to work on that more, uh, more than trying to make the best, the perfect economic integration, because it's already there. And it's a valid point, Cedric, and I, I think that hammering down that we should have not only an economic union, and of course, we will raise that point, an issue, that issue, the democratic union, because of, at the moment we have that democratic problem. We can't vote for the European Union. Uh, but also, your your point is very valid. We don't have a cultural Europe. I mean, we do have a cultural Europe. The rest of the world considers us one extremely rich continent, rich in history, rich in art, architecture, rich in culture, rich in music, rich in everything. But we consider we are, you know, an Italian is proud of Rome or or Naples. Uh, and a French guy will be proud of Nice or, or, or Paris, uh, but we don't. We are not proud of our enormous cultural history, uh, while we have every reason to do so. So we don't share that. And I think Cedric, that is a big point from coming from you because you are working very hard uh, with that page on G plus Europeans on G plus mm -hmm. to to enhance that feeling. You know that we we share this common history. Okay, um, Isaac, uh, what's yes. your view on this? Uh, I liked the discussion about uh, the European Union as a form of globalization, um, just like in China and in the United States. Um, as the world globalizes, as borders start to um, be less important, um, the European Union becomes more like a country. and. The, the talk about brain drain and um, exporting of jobs is something that I think would be expected in, in this situation just just as uh, in the United States everyone migrates to the big cities, New York, Los Angeles, in China everyone moves to Shanghai and, and the, where all the jobs are being created. In Europe we can expect people from Spain going to Paris or London and I think one of the obstacles we have in Europe is the differences in languages and cultures, um, but as we make those barriers, you know, less uh, hard to overcome, you know, we have social networks where we have Google Translate to, to involve more people and more people can understand and collaborate. We have more and more education in each country being taught in English and, and in common languages. So as time goes on, I, I can imagine a Europe where it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter where you study, you can be living any, you know, in any of the major cities and get a job and you know, start a, a life there. So yeah. I it, think it, Europe is moving in, in the correct direction. 
it's interesting because um, uh, apart from the UK, uh, most Europeans who go abroad to uh, to work or to gain more money, the brain drain, uh, have to learn a new language to work in the USA or to work uh, elsewhere or in Dubai or whatever. And uh, so what the European Union has to work on is the attractiveness of working inside Europe learning a new language it's not really a problem when you want to work abroad people already do it and have been doing it a lot so, so the language for the business is, is can be a problem when you you have to translate your website in uh, 27 languages it's true but for people who want to work abroad learning a new language has never been a problem in in history so it's it's not really a problem. So what do you say? Sorry, what do you just, say just, just one, uh, one very short comment. Uh, James, uh, I'm getting uh, feedback from people who are trying to join the Hangout and it says it's jam-packed. Is it mm -hmm. possible for you to, to post the YouTube link on the EU page? Uh, that's already there, uh, Alexander, but I'll repost it again. Okay. okay, so that won't be an issue. Now the question, the question is though, um, for any any evolve evolution of the European Union, it does require, in my personal opinion anyway, it will require the public to be involved. Um, up to now, it's always been the national governments that have made the decisions as to what will be given, um, what powers will be transferred to the European Union. Um, but the next step, if we do go down the path of federating, we actually do need to get the public involved. So, how do you see ways where one can get the general public involved in the discussion and yet still make it a factual one without the scaremongering? Um, Any thoughts? To this? Yeah, go for it, Alex. Uh, a couple of it, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I'd say that the whole point of uh, federalism is that it's bottom up. So it's not something that can be uh, pushed forward at the level of the European institutions alone. They can facilitate the situation, but they cannot. Uh, they can definitely not um, push it forward. And and I think that the uh, examples of pushing things forward uh, are exactly the things. Uh, bring exactly the negative effects and the reactions that we would not like to have. So number one, uh, though in reality the problems now are very urgent and we should, we should go quickly uh, forward, it's not something that we can really push. We need to get people involved. Uh, that's, that's one part of it. Um, at, at the same time, when you have uh, problems such as the ones that um, that are, that are, that we have at the moment that can only be resolved at a transnational level. Uh, we need to have more dialogue and much more uh, clear uh, discussions with the people that have the ideas. And I would say that at the moment, for the first time, it was my impression in the recent summit, we really had some thought leadership. On the parts of the on the part of the EU institutions, uh, we don't have yet the kind of leaders um, which dreamt, uh, envisioned uh, a European Union several decades ago. I don't think we have those kind of leaders at the moment, and we need this kind of leadership. How is this leadership going to, to, to appear? It's going to appear through the public dialogue. It's not going to appear in any other way. Uh, the no. leaders that we need might not be even part of the European institutions and we should accept this. They might not even be part of national governments because national governments have their own agenda. So what we, the only thing that we can do is dialogue and more dialogue and first of all to uh, consolidate what we have until now, the principles that we have until now and to say okay th this is the starting point, this is where we want to go, uh, we would like to go perhaps what do you what do you think about it? But I think that there is a, a very uh, I would I would like to say something which I think is optimistic. 
historically, if we look at how the European, uh, the United States became a federal state, a federal nation, uh, we will see that the differences in mentality were much, much greater than what we have in Europe today. Think, for example, of the death penalty. Think of slavery. Think of things, think of things like that. Even today, there is a gap between uh, the, the European Union and the other side of the Atlantic in what, uh, in what concerns the death penalty, in what concerns social issues, in what concerns health care. Uh, there are several points like that that I would say uh, highlight the fact that there is a common European uh, denominator where we can step uh, upon. And it is not necessarily something that is given by the European institutions. It might be reflected to them, but in reality is part of the mentality. Okay. Matt, uh, Robert? Yes, I would... Uh, I would really like to see that uh, that we use all the intelligence that we have in the European Union on on the very basic level that everybody can join a, a very fast and innovative and and fast reacting system. We should utilize all digital technologies uh, for the people and not against the people. So. Uh, what comes through the media sometimes is a little bit too scary. So. Uh, we are too focused on on all the laws that emerge that that give us the feeling of everybody's watching us with all the surveillance cameras and and data retention without really having a reason for that and and then we have the feeling why do we need u s uh, rating agencies that can with a simple uh, press release uh, 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 make make a big fear that, that our whole currency on, on the whole continent is shivering. So uh, we should uh, give the feeling to the people that, that we really can act together and, and uh, get more of the horsepower uh, onto the street together. Yeah. Do you think um, social sites like uh, Google+, Facebook, um, Twitter, etc. have some role to play in this? In yes, for sure. For example, the, the Hangouts and that you really have some kind of verification with, with Google that you are a real person when you have an account and especially the, the democratic structure of the Hangouts really helps uh, that you find people with the same interest and that you can quickly uh, communicate uh, for free uh, to discuss any topic in, in a nice panel like we do it here at the moment. Okay. Max, uh, Isaac actually, what's your view being the youngest, uh, one of the youngest in the um, panel? Uh, yeah, I think Twitter um, already plays a role because each um, person, you know, in Congress or in, in the Parliament can have a Twitter account and can send out their messages, but I think it can play a bigger, a bigger role. Before this meeting, I went over and I was just searching uh, European websites like Europa.eu, and they're you know very informative. They have places where the youth can find opportunities, but I think it can be taken to a next step with um, video conferencing, uh, with feedback, direct feedback with you know maybe someone can be in charge of chatting with visitors that have questions and really get involved because the web nowadays allows us to, you know, have community managers that are active on the social networks and I think if we can do that at a government level, um, like I've seen that happen in the United States, um, some state people answer questions directly on, on social media. So I think if that's taken to another level, it can be more approachable to the young people in Europe. Um, they can feel more in included in, in, you know, new new bills can be put online to read and give feedback on. So I really think that technology is, exists, and I think if we can get the European Parliament and and Europeans across the, the Union to, to be more involved in social media, it can really be helpful. Yes, Isaac, I, I fully agree. Uh, that, it, that, it, that the technology is there, 
to, to, to make this possible. And that uh, I also fully agree because you elaborate on the statement by Alexander that we need a bottom-up revolution. You know, we have had a top-down approach. We need a bottom-up approach now. Uh, so it has to come from the citizens, and the citizens need to feel that they are involved. Uh, and right. if you look at it, we, we, we cover Azure Tech, we cover uh, all technology and science coming from the United, from the <laughs> United States, from the, from the European <laughs> Union uh, as well. Uh, but if you, I, I see, we, I think we get a press, call, press uh, release every day, which we don't, we, got, we don't cover them all. All, almost everyone, everything the European Union uh, gets out is a call for action, is a, a, a call for participation by the citizens, etc. But the traction on these calls is 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 as good as zero. I, I know that in Brussels they will think that there was a huge participation by the audience, but there is in reality there is not. Um, a thing like the digital agenda, which was established just a month ago uh, in, in June, there was a digital agenda of 2012. Uh, the number of people who participated in discussing this uh, was, was very low, while, while the, the, every effort was made by the European Union to get as much people as they want. So there is, there is a problem there. Somehow the European Union doesn't know how to connect effectively with the citizens. They try to, but, and, and I, I, I mean, I studied international science, I, I, I'm old, not older than most people uh, in this hangout, most people who, who they want to have participating in these debates, so I am not their target group. I, if I, but I, even if I read these, these call-outs to participate, I think, what are you talking about? Why is it this complex? Why does it sound so difficult? Why does it sound so um, self-obsessed and so, in, you know, um, it, there is a Brussels circuit. Uh, you, can't, you, you, you can't deny it. There is a circuit in Brussels uh, where a number of people are very active, but they are excluding the others. Not, not on purpose. I, I think they have all the good in intentions. But there is, it, is, it is not effectively working. So, Isaac, your, your point is, 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 is a very good point. But so far, um, I, 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 there is a problem in the in the in the interaction and communication by the European Union. And maybe in, in, in on this platform, sorry for jumping in. Uh, as we speak about communication and complexity and differences in countries re, uh, still in the European Union, let me point out one very popular example here on, on this platform. This, this Hangout on Air, what we are using at the moment, is a wonderful tool that you cannot only discuss a topic with a small panel, but you can also broadcast it uh, to a huge audience. And for example, uh, Germany has a ridiculous law that does not allow a private uh, citizen to broadcast to more than 500 people at the same time. Otherwise, you would need a broadcasting license or pay a fine of 500,000 euros. So if you could ask um, <coughs> the politicians in Brussels if they could have a look at this issue, that we can really have a freedom of um, digital communication across uh, this uh, wonderful continent. And I'm sure uh, out of 500 million people, we have lots of potential to, to really make a difference. And we will also make our own rating agency and then the world can see where we are going. But Robert, sorry to interrupt, but this is, is, is this not the key, your own key argument? You, you are opposed to the, the more global character and you, you, you prefer to keep the local laws. And on the other hand, this is a typical local law in Germany uh, which should be put aside if we want to, if, if Europe wants to progress forward, and if, if, if Germany wants to progress, it, it needs to get rid of these backward laws. But saying so would be an insult to the Germans because it's their laws, not mine. So what, I do, what do I have to say? Yeah, we have to look at it from a European perspective. I'm, I'm yeah. saying uh, uh, local engagement is very easy because uh, the more local people are, the more it's it's more easy to trust others. 
and we are now in a transformation and it, it is uh, amplified by tools like the Hangouts, for example, and you see we have no problem to make a, a panel right here across Europe and we use the English language as it is the easiest one still uh, and you are right, um, I'm, I'm totally against uh, the complexity of laws and I believe Germany is one of the worst examples, they have the most laws and uh, in, rea in, reality, uh, in reality a citizen has no chance to know all laws that, that he could be affected by. So I would really like to see a positive uh, centralization uh, kind of uh, to, to simplify stuff across Europe. Yeah? One of the things I find really fascinating um, on the European Union and getting the message out there is as you know, I run the EU page here on Google Plus, and every day I go through and look at the press releases, the announcements, etc. And to be honest, there's about 30, 40, sometimes even 50 or 60 announcements made on what the EU is actually doing. And yet you look at the media, and the media doesn't actually communicate most of that. All you see is basically headlines, and a lot of information is actually omitted. Now, the media, from my perspective, in getting the message out there, needs to be involved as well. Um, social media is fantastic, um, but if the media is not on board, you're not going to get the message out. What do you think, as James, James. Or Cedric? Well, um, it's exactly that. Actually, um, the question has been asked to um, the journalists uh, throughout Europe. Um, is there a European public sphere? Is there a European public space where people can debate, can debate, can exchange information? And the, the, the response was that, was that there is not. And the, what's interesting with the technology is that uh, with this hangout, with the page Europeans on Cyprus, we can create this European public space uh, where people uh, across Europe can, can exchange. There is still um, the barrier of language, uh, but we're getting closer to this because um, in every country there are um, there are the national newspapers, etc., which participate to the public the public sphere, which um, uh, which creates the debates, etc. But there are no I have very few possibilities when I want to know what's happening in Austria, what's happening uh, in Spain and in other countries because um, there are few countries uh, which have uh, English newspaper and in general there is a very um, scattered European media sphere. So that, that's, the first, that's the first and major point uh, major bonus of the technology, Hangout, Google Plus, and all the social networks. Um, secondly, I would like to talk about um, the European Citizen Initiative, which is, uh, which is a great initiative by the, by the European Union uh, to allow people to shape the future, to help shape the future of the European Union. But there is, um, there is too little communication on that initiative, and what happens is that people mobilize, mobilize on uh, with or against European Union when there are events like the ACTA Treaty, uh, which which has stemmed a lot of debate, but. Uh, when I when I walk the street uh, and I look at uh, advertising about uh, the European Union, what I see is what the European Union does for me. But I can't see. I don't see uh, what can I do for the European Union. And I think that's a major problem of the communication of the European Union, and it affects the engagement of European citizens. True. Yeah, Alexander. Just just a couple of points more on this. I think uh, I think these are some of the most crucial points because they have 
do with participation, they have to do with democracy, and democracy, first of all, is, is non-exclusive. Now, there's the, the word idiot comes from the Greek word uh, idiotis, the ancient Greek word idiotis, which means private. And, and in, in ancient Athens, it was, uh, somebody was considered an, an, an idiot, it was an insult if they did not participate in the common, uh, in, the public, in the public debate. And now we need this kind of culture. But this kind of culture has two levels. One at the top level means that when we see an, uh, either national elections in European countries or in European elections, to have a turnout of 40 or 50 or 60 percent, th those 40 percent that are not voting, that's a very, very considerable um, uh, percentage and we, we should do something about it. We should look at why are they not participating. So that's, that's from the top level. Now from the bottom level, we need some kind of um, minimum participation, I would say. And uh, we see this now in, in, uh, in, in the countries that are facing uh, the, the major financial challenges. We are seeing people uh, reducing their expenses and among others, they are reducing their internet access. What this means is that we should provide free internet access to a broader range of people in order for them to be able to participate. Because all these tools, uh, Google Hangouts or, or Facebook plus Skype or whatever are wonderful as long as you really have access. So access is, uh, let's say, the, 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 the democracy of, of the 21st, 21st century. And precisely those, those points of giving access to everybody on the one hand, encouraging to participate, speaking in a language that is not the, the bureaucratic language of Brussels, uh, which is equivalent for many people to the kind of language that, that the Soviet Union spoke uh, uh, at, at the level of the commissars. Uh, this kind of thing needs, needs to change. We need simple discussions that everybody can participate in. And that does not mean that we are oversimplifying the issue. We should not do that. Uh, not a problem. Max? Well, you wanted to say something. <laughs> well, yeah, Alexander raises a valid point. Uh, access is crucial. If you don't have access, if you, if you don't have uh, free internet, you, are, you can't have that bottom-up debate we need in Europe. It's, it will be top-down. If there's no uh, grassroots movement in Europe, uh, there is no no, no, and there's no public debate, it will never succeed to become a, a Europe of the citizens, which we need. But to, to, to realize this, it is very, very important to have this digital agenda. Now, I guess not everybody knows what the digital agenda is, but uh, Commissioner Smith, uh, sorry, her, her, she used to be married to a guy called Smith, but she's now Nady Cruz, uh, who is very active. She is the commissioner for the digital agenda. Um, she, I think she in herself has done more for the European Union than most of her, of her uh, predecessors because she has been working hard in opening up digital frontiers and I think that is one of the most important things because at the moment if you like Robert Reddle, uh, if you notice that you, you want to have a local startup for instance, there is no way to provide services, digital services into another country in Europe. Why? Because, for instance, musical rights are still licensed completely locally. Uh, I have been just, you know, uh, I have, I'm, 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 an, I have been a European importer for um, for complex machinery, 3D stuff, but it contained music. A minor issue. I mean, it was just, you know, the, the nice sound. Uh, we we had a license from Sony, from BMI, called you name them, everyone for the whole of Europe. So. What was the problem? I, I didn't expect any problem. But the next thing I learned was in every, every country in Europe, I had to make deals and arrangements with all the local copyright holders again. While I had the, the license in my pocket, but still, to, because the sound was hearable, on, on, on national territory somewhere, I had to have a license. In Italy, we had, we, uh, the, the machine produced DVDs. Every DVD had to have a small sticker on it from the local Italian organization. It took seven to eight, seven or eight months to realize this. In Germany, 
we had the old, we had sorted it out in a few months, but we are not allowed to broadcast it on YouTube. No way people could share their own hobby products, which because in the background vaguely you could hear maybe a license song for which we had a proper license, no problem at all. Uh, in the UK we had no problems at all because it was very simplified. Uh, that is one of the advantages. It looks more like the American model. Uh, but in every country in Europe we have problems. Now this is exam an example which, which makes startup, it blocks startups because where is the, not the money but where is now the future economic activity in Europe? Not in making, in, not in manufacturing goods but in providing services. We are, you know, we are an advanced economy so we are into services. Now how do you provide services if you have all these invisible barriers in Europe? We have the freedom, uh, the open functions for products, which is nice, so we can ship whatever we want to wherever. We can we can transport people because you are allowed to travel and to work within freely within Europe. The services are completely blocked. Uh, most of the startups mm. nowadays, if you are now young and you want to start a business, you will be thinking about a service, a digital service probably, and the barriers to provide that service within Europe are huge. If you, what happens is that most startups, and this is, uh, I mean, I, I ha I'm hammering on this point for years now, but it is really more than annoying, it's devastating to see that startups have to move to the United States, European startups have to move to the United States to succeed. Why? Because they need one large market to target. If you are a small company, you can't, you, you are not capable of realizing uh, legis legislation and compliance with legislations for 27 countries. It's just not doable. So what you do and what the investors say, move to San Francisco, make your startup have that one internal market of 200, sorry, 300 million people in, in the United States. And if you succeed there, come back to Europe where you will meet the 500 million people, which are one market, but then you have the lawyers and the skills and the people to sort it out. Now, this is so crucial if we can't Cross that digital, the, the, the digital fence which is invisible between these countries. If we can't take that down, there will be no citizens initiative for Europe. That's true. One of the things you raised earlier, sorry to butt in there, um, was regarding uh, music and copyright, etc. That's probably one of the biggest um, frustrating things that a lot of people have in Europe and around the world, where you can't actually play or watch something because of copyright restrictions. Um, with the EU, if it goes down the path of federating, um, that would actually provide an impetus to actually produce EU-wide laws regarding copyright. I'm getting back to you, sorry. Um, but the people themselves have to be interested in being involved, and that's where the social media side of things has to come in. Um, so I'm getting a lot of feedback from my side, guys. Uh, Isaac, did you want to say something? Uh, I just wanted to agree with with um, Max about the uh, businesses having a hard time crossing borders in Europe, and I think that's one of the most important things that can be done. If I could buy internet from a Swedish internet provider, um, you know, it would be much better than Mobistar or, or the ones I have here. If I can, uh, if services can be interchanged the way, you know, across states in the United States, it would. I would think it would change the face of of businesses in Europe, I think there would be much more opportunity, much more revenue, and the people would be able to get, you know, if I try to start a business right now in Barcelona, it would be way too expensive because of the taxes that we have to pay out of pocket, and I think if the European central government has one important role would be to even the playing field across Europe so that everyone can be involved not only in um, creating politics, but also in starting businesses and being entrepreneurs and um, getting jobs across state, you know, different countries. So I think so, if that can be a focus, I think it would be a, a very big, big change. But there are um, there are a lot of efforts yet to make uh, from the the side uh, of European Union because. Uh, just one example, uh, we, we talked about uh, 
already uh, Lexon that talked about um, Erasmus generation. Uh, my, my problem is uh, I go to uh, Vienna, I go to uh, whatever Europe, a European city for three months or six months. I don't have uh, a sort of uh, website, a central hub where I can discuss with other Erasmus uh, travelers. Uh, there is no uh, structure uh, to help people connect on the internet while it would be the best place to to do this and around uh, already um, uh, already very strong structure structure Erasmus uh, there should be a way for people to discuss before to discuss um, after about their experiences to to create uh, a bit more this European public sphere where people can communicate. And there are, I believe, a lot of efforts to do in this direction. Okay. Um, any other comments regarding this? Because we did allocate about an hour, and believe it or not, the hour is nearly up. Uh, yeah. Any other yeah. comments? I, well, my, I, I would suggest uh, that we do, uh, because if you watch this later, if you watch this on YouTube, it's very annoying to watch uh, two-hour hangouts. You know, it's an obstacle. So maybe we should cut this hangout for now, open up a second one, just, you know, just go on with the conversation, but, uh, and focus solely on what we, as, I, as in we European citizens, the watchers, the viewers, uh, can do, how we can use social media, uh, to realize a bottom-up Europe. I think yeah. we, ident ident we identified most of the problem, mm -hmm. but now we need to look at the in solutions. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my, my yeah. wrap-up works. Sorry. Please, please go on. Thank you. Uh, my wrap-up words would be, uh, yes, we have many languages and we have many and complex topics across the whole continent, but we have 500 million people out there and if we split the topics and even the languages up and make small panels uh, everywhere through the hang Hangouts, that's very easy. I'm quite sure that we can get lots of interesting discussions and keep the dialogue going. Just a quick point. Um, in 2013, it will be the, um, the European Year of, of European Citizenship. Um, and if you take a look at the, the website, the Europa website, uh, you see that only one million has been allocated to this initiative. One million, why it's one of the most, uh, the, the biggest oh. problem of the European Union is to uh, uh, um, promote the European citizenship. And I think there are that there should be a shift in some priorities, in some budget allocation, because uh, even though um, there are still problems to help local businesses to reach the whole European, uh, the whole European market, um, the big lacking, uh, the big lacking, uh, the big lack in the European Union is the implication of individual citizens. The what, sorry? The, the implication? The implication, the engagement of individual citizens. The engagement and involvement. Yeah, 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 the engagement and involvement, yeah. All right, true. Okay, Dike. Go on, Max, sorry. No, no, I, I, I think we should, you know, it's we are now close to the one hour. Maybe it's a good idea to have uh, next session, immediately starting after this one, so that people can watch the YouTube as a separate issue and then just focus on how we can well, address what Cedric is saying, you know, how, how, can we, how can we, the people, do something about Europe? Just a couple of brief points as a wrap-up for my part, if you want. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I agree yeah, that right. we, can, we can close it here and then uh, continue on a new one. Um, I think that what what uh, the European Union is facing today is is a knowledge management issue, and it's something that big corporations have faced in the past, and some have managed to overcome it, some have not, and they have lost along the way. Um, why I say this? Because I would say that that for most 
um, problems that we can think of, solutions are there. For example, take a huge problem like the euro. Uh, there are at the moment, along, uh, all over the European Union, there are local currencies. And I mean local currencies, not national currencies. Right. Local currencies mm -hmm. at the level of, of, of municipalities, for example, that are working uh, both for services and for goods. Um, replacing the informal bat battering with a more objective uh, system. Uh, the, the issue, of course, is not to have such currencies at the European Union level, but the issue is that for, for local problems, there might be local solutions. And many uh, issues, such as the, transfer, the, 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 the trading of goods uh, with a problematic currency, can be solved at the local level. So we should be able to see for each issue that we have, where is the ideal solution? Is it at the top level? Is it at the ground level? Is it, is it at the intermediate level? Are there parallels, parallel solutions that we should find? And, and parallel solutions, I think, is precisely uh, the best approach because, it's, because it is a contingency approach. It means that for each uh, issue that we have, we find something which is complementary to each other. We do not, we cannot solve everything at the same time for everybody. Uh, so I would say that, that both what Robert was saying and both what Max was were saying about different aspects at the level of legislation, I think there is room for everything. And, and precisely the, the multiculturalism and the plurality uh, behind the European Union allows for something like this. Right. Sure. Okay, Doug. What we'll do, guys, is we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, we'll take a say a fifteen minute break, and then be back on air for those that want to stay, just to cover more issues and also to give people a chance to go and do what they need to do. If you know what I mean. Any and thanks for coming uh, as what, well. What about what about coffee? What about coffee? Coffee sounds like coffee, a Sunday morning. Coffee. Sunday morning coffee. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Coffee sounds break. Good. Yeah. Okay. So what we'll do for those that are listening and watching, um, feel free to post comments and questions, etc., on either the YouTube page or the Google Plus page. Um, but we'll be back shortly in about 15 minutes. Um, Alex. So there will be a new link, a new link on the European yes. Union. Side. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. Okay, guys. Okay. We'll see you in about 15. Thank you. Catch Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.